The first atomic bomb was dropped on the city of Hiroshima, Japan, in an attempt to end the war in the Pacific during the Second World War. It killed over 80,000 people on the spot, not to mention those who died over time from exposure to radiation. It also indirectly destroyed the life of one man, Robert Oppenheimer, who tried to prevent another similar mass murder from happening. In 1942, General Leslie L. Groves took charge of the Manhattan Engineer District, better known as the Manhattan Project. Groves appointed Oppenheimer as the leader of the scientific aspect of it, amazed at his overweening ambition and by his intriguing ideas. Oppenheimer had had an extraordinary career, obtaining his PhD in Germany after graduating from Harvard in 1925 and studying at Cambridge under Ernest Rutherford. In 1929, he returned to the United States where he held faculty positions at Berkeley and Caltech. He was an extraordinary teacher and an excellent theoretician as he predicted many scientific discoveries such as the neutron, positron, meson, and neutron stars. After his appointment, Oppenheimer began a recruiting search for the best scientists in the country to join the Manhattan Project and brought the best minds in physics to work on the problem of creating the atomic bomb, including Niels Bohr, Hans Beth, David Bohm, and many others. Although Oppenheimer did not accomplish any major scientific work soon after the beginning of the Manhattan Project, he skillfully led the other scientists on the path to discovery. In the end, he was managing more than 3,000 people, as well as dealing with the theoretical and mechanical problems that came up. Also, in the early stages, Groves had to decide on a site for his top-secret laboratory. There were two options, around the city or in a remote place. Many people thought the idea of placing the laboratory near a city would be more feasible from logistic points of view. However, Oppenheimer fought to have the lab built in the high desert of the West, mostly because he grew up on the mesas of New Mexico. He succeeded, and the lab was built at Los Alamos, New Mexico, 35 miles northwest of Santa Fe. In 1942, however, Enrico Fermi succeeded in creating a controlled chain reaction in his Chicago laboratory. This convinced Oppenheimer even more of the feasibility of an atomic bomb. When the project was first started, the scientists believed that they were attempting to beat the Axis nations led by Hitler in making the bomb, or even to use it against them during the Second World War. Therefore, when the Allies won in Europe, the scientists were convinced that their work was done. However, those were not the instructions from the government. They were told to continue to develop the atomic bomb to be used in the war that was still going on in the Pacific. After two years of intense work, the scientists of the Manhattan Project designed the first fully functional atomic bomb, nicknamed the Gadget. Even though all the research and theoretical work pointed towards a feasible outcome, only testing it would prove this. Oppenheimer chose to test this prototype in an area 60 miles west of Alamogordo, New Mexico, which he named Trinity. On July the 16th, 1945, the test bomb exploded in the New Mexico desert. Its force was equivalent to 18,000 tons of TNT. One of the scientists in particular, I.I. Rabi, recalled that he was overwhelmed by the spectacle of the explosion, but frightened when he realized what this could mean for humanity. He knew the world would not be the same. Few people laughed. Few people cried. Most people were silent. I remembered the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. Oppenheimer's efforts towards the development of the atomic bomb earned him the Presidential Medal of Merit in 1946. Even before the Manhattan Project was in full force, a Hungarian-born U.S. scientist, Leo Szilard, fought for the discontinuation of the research. He believed that the use of the atomic bomb in a war situation would eventually result in an arms race between America and Russia. He tried to convey his beliefs to scientists like Oppenheimer and Albert Einstein, and even to President Roosevelt, but he failed in getting his message across. On August 6, 1945, the first atomic bomb, nicknamed Little Boy, was dropped on the city of Hiroshima, and three days later, the second one, named Batman, was dropped on Nagasaki.
The devastation was beyond any expectations, both in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Only four days later, on August 10th, President Truman received the unconditional surrender of Japan. Overnight, Oppenheimer achieved instant fame and was nicknamed the father of the atomic bomb. Oppenheimer again assumed a leading role in the matter of the bomb, only that this time he advocated against it using his newfound publicity. On October 25th, 1945, in a private meeting with President Truman, he said, I feel I have blood on my hands. The scientists, now seeing the effects of the bomb on the civilization, cried out against the atomic bomb's future military use. Oppenheimer also opposed the development of an even more powerful hydrogen bomb. When President Truman finally approved it, Oppenheimer did not publicly oppose it, but his earlier reluctance turned against him. In spite of the pessimism of so many scientists in the months after the Second World War about the future of nuclear energy, as part of the McMahon Act, an Atomic Energy Commission was established in 1946 outside of the military which emphasized civilian control and a high degree of freedom in future nuclear energy research. Oppenheimer was chosen as chairman of the General Advisory Committee of this commission. That same year, Oppenheimer quit his job at Berkeley because of political issues. He became the director of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University. While Oppenheimer was the chairman of the General Advisory Committee, Louis Strauss was the president of the commission. Strauss was paranoid of any member of the Atomic Energy Commission who opposed him. He thought that people would either with him or against him, much like Senator McCarthy thought that one could either be a true American or a communist. Oppenheimer's conservative views about the use of nuclear energy clashed with Strauss' ideas. Therefore, Strauss worked closely with Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, to collect information about Oppenheimer in order to discredit him by accusing him of being a communist. When Oppenheimer was called up to testify whether he had any probable cause of being a communist, he made a subtle joke on Strauss, embarrassing him. It was from this point on that Strauss was bent on having Oppenheimer fired from the Atomic Energy Commission and his security clearance removed. In one of the most spectacular communist accusations of the McCarthy era, Oppenheimer was accused of being a communist sympathizer. During the trial, unfortunately, many people testified against him. The decisive witness was Edward Teller. Teller was a Hungarian-born U.S. scientist who had been a personal enemy of Oppenheimer. The animosity started when Oppenheimer named Hans Beck in charge of the theoretical division of the Los Alamos National Laboratory. Teller was highly offended by this appointment and to believe that he was more experienced and knowledgeable than Beck. Teller testified in the trial that it would be wise to convict Oppenheimer on the grounds of the presented evidence. The prosecutors, in order to present their case, argued that Oppenheimer's circle of family and close friends included a lot of communist or communist sympathizers. For example, they claimed that Oppenheimer's brother, Frank, was a known Communist Party member, reason for which he was fired in 1949 from the University of Minnesota. They also said that Oppenheimer's past fiance, Jean Tatlock, was a Communist member herself, and even Oppenheimer's wife, Kitty, was accused of being a Communist sympathizer. Even though Oppenheimer said while testifying, I have never been a member of the Communist Party on May 6, 1954, he was convicted as a Communist and had his security clearance removed. Stripped of his clearance, Oppenheimer was politically mutant. He would no longer be asked to advise the people in charge of managing the atomic energy or the weapons they had helped create. Also, he would not be allowed to access the data in laboratories that he had nurtured. After his conviction, Oppenheimer continued his job as the director of the Institute for Advanced Study. There, he spread on discussions and did research on quantum and relativistic physics. In 1962, he was approached by Glenn Seaborg who was the chairman of the AEC at that time. Seaborg asked Oppenheimer whether he wanted to have another security hearing to clear his name. Oppenheimer refused. He did not want to go again through the hassle and the publicity. President Lyndon Johnson, however, reinstated his clearance in 1963. In that same year, he was awarded the Enrico Fermi Award for Excellency in Physics by the Atomic Energy Commission. Oppenheimer retired from Princeton in 1966 and died of throat cancer on February 18, 1967. He devoted his last years to write about the problems of intellectual ethics and morality. Oppenheimer's tragedy started when he realized that another use of the atomic bomb could possibly mean the destruction of civilization. However, the government took advantage of people's fear of the rise of post-war Soviet Union and annihilated his efforts of informing the public about the looming dangers of the atomic bomb. His legacy resides in founding the American School of Theoretical Physics while at the University of California, Berkeley. Through Oppenheimer's efforts, the U.S. became one of the most advanced scientific centers in the world.
Nevertheless, his name has become almost synonymous with the atomic bomb, as well as with the dilemmas facing scientists when the interests of a nation and their own conscience come face to face.